Uh, now for the fun part. So I've got, um, I've got a rhythmic track. And I've talked about how, I, I demonstrated how, uh, just by happenstance sort of, my, uh, the rhythm, the rhythmic, the rhythm track suggested a, a little, me a, a, a melody, a melodic motif, a little riff uh, uh, that I could key on to build from. So now I'm, I'm charged with the challenge of uh, creating um, a, a guitar solo in improvisation. And I always like to start with something that I call, uh, that I stole from what I heard something, I heard something Miles Davis said. Uh, I heard Miles Davis say, he looks for the melody within the melody. So now that I know, so I start off my improvisation with, right? So now I've just taken my inner voice from, from the uh, G minor to E half diminished. And I've posed the question. And now, with the inner voice from the A half diminished to D7 altered, I'm going to give the answer. So, I like call and response. And, and that's a very popular technique. Um, because uh, uh, the other thing about that, I, I, I'm so glad I get to talk about this, because for me, music is, uh, is, is communication. And communication, it, it, you have to find a common language and uh, um, a vocabulary. And we talk about, uh, sometimes we talk about vocabulary in terms of uh, 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 classic motifs and cliches that have been made, that have been made uh, uh, sort of standard by the, by the legends, whether it's Charlie Parker or Dizzy Gillespie or, or Wes Montgomery or Joe Pass or even Jimi Hendrix, things that, think, riffs that, we, that become so uh, um, second nature, they're household, you know, every, everyone knows them. But you can create, uh, make, make these statements and communicate uh, uh, and have call and response with the, with, with the track with yourself, with musicians, and even with the audience by being mindful of having a place to start making a statement, giving it a moment to breathe, and then coming back with a response. So. So that was my first statement. And then when I come back again. Now I've taken, that was my first statement. Now the second one, I revisit that, I just, just tweak it a little bit. I just build on it just a little. All the while being conscious of trying to, f uh, trying to form it or create or, 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 or shape it in a way that the, that's, it's, it's a singable type of a motif. Because I don't intend to stay there. Right, I intend for 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 each each statement, for each pass, each visit of this motif to become a little bit more intense, because the whole idea is to create an arc, right? So that uh, I have a starting place, I build intensity, kind of build the music up around me, so that my presence, uh, my presence in the track, in the music, in the performance is felt, and 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 then I slide, and then I and then I ease out. So you don't want to just come in and, and speak real fast and have a lot of things that are we're, we're haphazard because people can't follow along. So I, start, I come in and I want to speak clearly and slowly and, and inviting. <laughs> and now when I get to the release, as I mentioned before, now I'm, I'm not so much concerned with another melody as I am with outlining the chord changes, being really specific so that you can hear the motion. Because I think uh, it's great when you talk about taking a solo or improv and you want to know what key a song is in. I learned a long time ago that it's, it's way, it's, it's way uh, easier to, to stay on point in your improvisations and to keep everybody with you if, if, if you think of keys as what's happening in the moment. So every chord change is its own key center, it's its own tonal center. So while, while what I'm playing is all in the key of G minor or the relative key of B flat major for this progression, each chord has its own, its own subtle difference. So G, the G minor is just... That's your G Aeolian, right? Uh, and then the E 
minor seven uh, is, is your E low crew. That B flat, the flat five, is what changes the, the E minor seven flat five from an E minor seven. Right, so E minor seven. And E minor seven flat five. So just that one subtle difference. Gives gives the uh, uh, the feeling of pushing uh, pushing pushing you for the re for the resolution. And if you take away the track, you take away the drums, you take away the you take away the rhythm track, you take away the chords. Just listening to the notes that I play in my improvisation will also specifically outline the harmony, which you can't do if you're just playing uh, 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 just playing in the key. Right? It may be cool, but this allows allows for everyone to follow me, follow along with me, or follow along with you, just a little bit easier. It's also fun because now you can now you have all of these new things to focus on. The subtle differences that make uh, um, make scales and improvisation uh, and arpeggio make make these things come together as music that sounds that's 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 not monotonous. So these little subtleties And then I knew this was coming. So and while something like that seems like it's really complicated, it's just an octave. So I know that I'm playing a D7 altered. And I mentioned earlier I referenced uh, uh, using uh, diminished motion, right? So anything that you play can be moved symmetrically, whether it's in minor thirds, major thirds, and you come back to where you start. So if I, if I play this, this D here, if I keep going to minor thirds, I end up back at D. So all I do is I take and I add the flat nine. And, and then, you get this. Those kind of devices make it makes more out of that moment. So I get the most out of that altered sound that I can. It adds some drama to the improvisation, and I, and I find those kinds of things are great for grabbing someone's attention because uh, uh, you're playing along. It's cool. It's mellow. It's grooving, and then you play something. And if you really pay close attention, you'll see that every once in a while, I play a major third over a minor chord. So we're in G minor. And then every once in a while, you hear me play. That's intentional. So I get the... devices allow me to add just a little more spice to my improvisations, make something simple, because it doesn't have to be complicated to be cool or memorable. It just has to have a little something different. And I find that uh, um, paying really close attention and respecting the chord, the chord progression and being able to, to accentuate some of the tensions uh, uh, in, in additions to accords instead of just playing minor seven, playing minor seven flat five, instead of just playing D seven, playing D seven with a sharp nine and a flat nine, gives my solo, uh, uh, gives my improvisation not only forward motion, but it sets up the anticipation uh, for, so that the listener is waiting for the resolution. When it comes, it makes it that much more effective. That's how I think about that.